Thank you. So it's a great honor to be on these lands. Thank you for the welcome, both the one today and especially the one yesterday with the elders. You know, around the world, people are asking the question of what is it that we need to know to help Indigenous children? There are research institutes dedicated to it. There are reports being written about it. There are many searchers for the answers. And yet I believe that's the wrong question. I believe that the harms that are being done to Indigenous children continue to be done because we don't implement the answers we already know. We have consistently in Canada, and if you will, I'll say it here, we have consistently failed to do better when we know better. And why is that? Why is it that as adults, and particularly those of us who are in the human social sciences, have not been able to do better when we know better for little kids? What is it that stops us from doing that? And why haven't we had the courage to not only confront our own histories of often being complicit and active actors 
in genocide and in colonialism in ways that prepare us to have a more productive relationship with today's generation of Indigenous children and their communities. If we don't figure out this question of why we don't do better when we know better, then the research makes no difference. In some ways, the research can actually be a pathway, an excuse, an official procedure that masks our cowardice in not taking the steps necessary to do what we can to make their lives better. And so that's what I've been fixated on for the last number of years, is why is it that we don't do better when we know better? And I haven't come across all the answers, but I'm hoping that through today's discussion we can explore a few of them. In our traditions, in First Nations communities in Canada, we believe uh, in a bunch of values, things like truth and honesty and respect and humility. Those values are shared by many people around the world, not just Indigenous peoples, but other peoples as well. Courage is not a value in and of itself. Courage is the activator of those values. It is what makes it possible for us to express those values when there is particularly some risk to us or even a perceived risk to us for speaking out and for acting when others would wish us to be silent or to sit down. Or when we've created a society or even a professional code, a sometimes an unwritten code that asks us to be silent and to sit down. I'm going to be sharing some images of persons who are deceased, so I just want to advise people of this. These persons are, though, in many ways, teachers to us. You know, uh, I was watching a program this morning on Jane Fonda, who's now 80 years old and looking fantastic, may I say. But as she was talking, she says, there are people who say, don't look at the past, and she agrees that that's a mistake. Because if you don't look at the past, you will never learn how to create a better future. And that's what these characters are. This is one of my greatest heroes. Now you heard about the human rights case we filed against the Canadian government in 2007. That came on the heels of a stack of reports dating back to 1911, documenting the unequal treatment of the Canadian government and its failure to be able to address those inequities. And how those inequities indeed not only resulted in the mass removals of Indigenous children from their families on far different terms than non-Indigenous kids, but also the deaths of those children. Canada has known about that for decades. And in fact, social work in our country has collective amnesia. We forget that these reports even exist, so we get excited about redocumenting the inequalities and expecting different action instead of really checking ourselves at the door and saying, why isn't that they have not repeatedly acted on what they already know? This is a man with moral courage. Moral courage is having the courage to speak up and act out when there will be some repercussion for yourself or a perception of a repercussion for yourself, personally or professionally. And in social work, we have a higher duty. You know, most people are morally courageous when their family is at stake or maybe their friends. They're less apt to be morally courageous with strangers. And yet that is the covenant we have as social workers. It is our job, and in fact it's our duty to stand and take the winds of discrimination head on for those who will never, ever know to be thankful to us. That is our fundamental raison d'etre as a profession. And yet I can think of very few social workers in Canada who've actually done that. We put up posters of social justice and I turn them around and say, when? When has a major movement in our country been led by social workers? And I can find very few examples. But there are morally courageous examples in our history, and this is one of them. His name is Peter Henderson Bryce. And the day before our Prime Minister apologized for the wrongs that were done in residential school, just a few months after Rudd issued his apology, I was in Ottawa, and I wanted to go somewhere special. And I had read about this man, a doctor who had spoken out about the needless deaths of kids in residential schools. 
But I had no idea until that day before the apology that he was buried just a few kilometers from where I lived. So I went to the Byward Market, which is a public market close to where I lived, and I bought a bouquet of brightly colored daisies because they represented the joy of children to me. And I walked into Beechwood Cemetery, which is our national cemetery, and they have huge monuments there, right? Prime ministers and uh, lumber barons and all kinds of important people are buried there. I had not, uh, no idea where I was going, where he would be buried, but one thing for sure, I knew he would not be under one of those tall monuments because real heroes need not shout. And sure enough, I found him in a little valley and there he is under a, an old maple tree and it had knots in it, which the elder said was totally appropriate and a, a symbol of the struggle that he had undergone. And I laid the flowers at his graveside and I gave thanks for what he had done. And I told him about the legal case we had filed against the Canadian government. And I told him I would be back when the kids won. And why is it that I would stand there? Well, in 1904, he was commissioned by the Canadian government to go and survey the health of kids in residential schools. And what he found there is that the death rate was 25%. If you followed the kids over three years, 48% were dead. And in one school with complete records of every three children that walked in, only one would walk out alive. Now, what Dr. Bryce also found, and he's an expert in infectious disease, at this time the, the president of the American Public Health Association, he found that Canada was spending $1 on First Nations children's health compared to $3 on non-Indigenous children's health. And yes, there were non-Indigenous kids dying of TB back then, but not at these rates. Bryce comes back to Ottawa. He lays the evidence before the Canadian government. He says, equalize out the funding and implement some practical reforms. Stop putting sick kids in with healthy kids. Stop exhausting the children by forcing them into servitude. Feed them properly. Get rid of the unsanitary conditions in these schools. Do those things and you could save their lives. The Canadian government, it would have cost them ten dollars to $15,000 to implement Bryce's reforms. Now you might be thinking to yourself, that was a lot of money in 1904. It was, but not in proportion to Canada's national budget, which at the time was already in excess of $100 million a year. It was a pittance for a wealthy country back then. But Canada said, no, we can't afford it. And then Dr. Bryce, unsatisfied with that response, because he was a doctor who took the Hippocratic Oath, but he also had the moral courage to believe that he had to stand up for it. It's not enough to sign up for a code of ethics and then only use it when it's convenient or non-threatening. He knew that his duty as a doctor was to do everything he could to help those kids. So this is the front page of our, our newspaper in Ottawa, our capital, and it's the Evening Citizen from 1907. And you can see right on the front page was schools aid white plague. This news article was repeated in newspapers all across Canada. It would have been chosen by the editors of these papers because it was scandalous at the time. So often we as members of the public and indeed as social workers, we think those things happened back then because people didn't know any better. But clearly people did know better. Dr. Bryce knew better, the editors of the newspapers knew better, and so did a lawyer named Samuel Hume Blake, who upon reading this in his newspaper, and he was a, later became one of Canada's leading judges, said that in Canada fails to obviate the preventable causes of death, it brings itself into unpleasant nearness with manslaughter. Now Canada, faced with this being over the newspapers, was not inspired to kind of question and maybe check themselves and ask if they were doing right. Instead, they wanted to go after the whistleblower, 
and they proceeded to have a whole process of retaliation against Dr. Bryce. They immediately cut all of his research funding. They tried to discredit him, but he was such a, so established in the medical field by that time, that became really untenable. They weren't successful there. But then they were absolutely determined to erase this man from Canadian history. And he had a rightful place in Canadian history, even for the work that he did outside of residential schools, because he wrote the first health code in Canada, one that actually was modeled throughout all provinces and into the United States. He's the reason why we have mandatory vaccinations in Canada and clean water codes in Canada. And he's widely credited for saving at least 15,000 non-Indigenous lives due to stopping the trains from moving from Ottawa to Montreal because there was an outbreak of disease. He should have been page one of any history book, but Canada made sure that no one knew of him. And Dr. Bryce, though, despite this retaliation, never gave up. He kept on pressing inside of the civil service. Keep in mind, this was a guy who was a medical doctor in the government itself. In 1922, he finally gets pushed out of the public service, but he decides he's gonna take another stab at grabbing the conscience of the people, the public. Our schools of social work were already established in two provinces, McGill University, where I teach, and also the University of Toronto. These papers would have been read by social workers of our time, and yet we have no response that social workers ever did, took any action as regard to this. But Dr. Bryce decides he's gonna do this manuscript called A Story of a National Crime. He publishes it in 1922, and he circulates free copies to members of the clergy, members of the government, and leading business leaders with the hope they'll do something. And he includes a very important phrase there. He said, since the time of Edward I, the people have ever exercised their historic right to lay their petitions before the king and parliament. I now desire here and respectfully to bring my appeal for the Indians of Canada before the king's representative and the parliament of Canada, feeling sure that justice will be done both to them and to myself. He assumed that if other people knew that these kids were dying, people would speak up and they would do the right thing. It was simply the right thing to do. And while there were some that spoke up, social workers weren't among them. And many people were silent. And therefore, the children continued to die. Now, he was not the only whistleblower. This is a letter that was written by a little boy a year after Dr. Bryce's report, A National Crime, was published. Bryce's report is published in 1922. This letter comes to us in the Christmas season of 1923. And as you can see, it's addressed, Dear Parent. Now, we don't know what this letter ever got to his parents. What we do know is that this was written by a little boy named Edward B, who is living in one of the residential schools in Canada. And as you can see, he is laying clear the situation of the treatment of the boys in his school. They're so hungry that they're eating cats and they're eating wheat. And he is so uh, tired of being maltreated by one of the teachers that the only thing that he can think to do as a little boy is to strike out at that teacher the next time she hits him. Now, as I said, this letter didn't make it to his parents. We don't have any evidence that it did, but the letter did make it into the hands of someone very important. The same man who said no to Dr. Bryce, Duncan Campbell Scott. Duncan Campbell Scott was hired by our first Prime Minister, John A. Macdonald, for the fee of $1.50. He was a wannabe doctor himself, but he came from a minimal financial means and was never able to go to university. So he took up the post as the Superintendent of Indian Affairs and he oversaw the residential school regime for 52 years. In his off time, he was quite an established uh, artist. He, would, uh, he was a musician, he was a Confederate poet, 
and he was indeed the president of our Royal Society of Canada in 1922, the very year the Bryce's report came out, just blocks from where the Royal Society of Canada was headquartered. And yet there is no record that members of the Royal Society, that being the highest creme the creme of academic society, ever said anything about their president. Now what did Bryce, or Dr. Duncan Campbell Scott say about him? Well, he said that the children, 99% of the children in residential schools are too fat anyway. And what he decided to do is to make attendance at the residential schools mandatory. Before, there was a lot of coercion used to put children in residential school, but now it would be mandatory for all First Nations children to go into those conditions that Dr. Bryce had already documented. And there were relentless reports coming to the Canadian government. In fact, there were so many that one of uh, D Duncan Campbell Scott's highest bureaucrats, a man by the name of Bennett said, that I am not gonna put any more adverse reports before you because you do nothing with them. Nothing with them. Now, Duncan Campbell Scott is an interesting character because although he was a conformist as a bureaucrat, he was being rewarded for his conduct in broader society. He received honorary doctorate degrees. He received the Lauren Pierce Medal, which is probably our highest prize in literature. And when he finally retires from the public service, the Canadian government hosts a huge reception for him as a loyal servant to the public of Canada. He was rewarded for moral cowardice. Whereas Bryce, the morally courageous, acting in the right position of the public, was persecuted. And yet, I think this story, this theme, still has contemporary resonance, where we too often persecute those who stand up and we reward those who are conformists and we create systems that reward conformity, including in social work. Now, one of the things that we felt was important when I went to see Dr. Bryce is to really a hundred years later to try and set the record straight. And so we saw a bunch of historical plaques over the nine years that the case was going on with Canada. They fought it tooth and nail. They brought eight motions to dismiss it. They actually retaliated it against me. They were found to do willful and reckless retaliation. I got $20,000, which I donated to children's causes. It was a nasty battle. And during that time when I go to see Bryce, just to update him on what was going on, I noticed these historical plaques being put up at the cemetery, marking the grave sites of these people who have played important roles. I thought to myself, Bryce needs such a plaque, right? And so we, uh, we actually erected a historical plaque for Dr. Bryce, but we did more than that. We took all the historical research into that and translated that into curriculum for children. And what was so interesting is that curriculum for children actually is very good for many Canadian adults who have been taught nothing about this stuff. So it's actually being used, the same curriculum is being used to teach children as is being used as a reference for judges in the British Columbia court system because they grew up knowing nothing. So how do we become more morally courageous? Well, one of the things that's so striking to me is we often want people to advocate in various professions, not just social work, but in public health, the nursing, teaching, but we never teach people to be courageous. We never ask people to be courageous. We don't even bring up the idea of having to sacrifice anything. It's kind of made out to be a nice thing to advocate. And um, people don't really understand what good advocacy is. They kind of think it's fighting right away, when actually good advocacy isn't that at all, when you know how to do it properly, right? You have to do it like Bryce did, which is bring all the evidence and come with a solution, and then when, you, when they resist, that's when you start to get into those uh, other strategies. But what they did, uh, a guy named Rutherford Kidder has done a lot of work on moral courage, and he had a group of people 
uh, select from this long list of values what your top five values are. Because we rarely even ask ourselves what those top five values are for us ourselves, what they are in our profession, and how much are we prepared to sacrifice in order to have those, those values met. And um, you can see there's a whole long list of them. Some of them you may find some resonance with. There may be others on the list you would not. But when he put this to a group of 500 people from around the world, they, um, they're 272, pardon me, from 40 countries and 50 faith groups. This is the top tiers of the values that they clinked into. So truth, compassion, and responsibility are the top tier values. And then we have freedom, reverence for life, fairness, self-respect, preservation of knowledge, our nature, tolerance, and generosity. And then the third tier is humility and social harmony, honor, devotion, and respect for elders. Those are what he argues as basically our fundamental human values. They're manifested in different types of ways. And the way to do um, it, uh, moral courage is to identify what that ranking of values is for you. And in what situation are you prepared to draw the line and take the sacrifice? For us at the Caring Society, when we filed that, law, that case against the Canadian government, about half of our funding came from the Canadian government. And given that we live in a democratic nation, within 30 days of filing it, we lost all of our funding. And a lot of people will, uh, said to us at the time, you know what, if you do this, you're gonna lose all your funding and then your organization's gonna go down and we'll have no one. And there was good reason to believe that because that's exactly what happened before. They would go after a First Nations organization, would speak out, they cut their funding, they disappear, and then they move on. But in this particular case, we had been told by an elder the best piece of advice I've ever given, which is never fall in love with the Caring Society. Never fall in love with your business card. Only fall in love with the children because there may come a day when you have to sacrifice both those things for them. And he wanted us to actually say at our very founding what the issue is that we're prepared to go down for. And for us it was clear, our kids deserved an equitable chance to grow up and in their families. Our kids deserved an equitable chance to go to schools that weren't contaminated with black mold. Our kids actually deserved the same opportunity to have clean water as other kids. That's what we were prepared to stand up for. And so when we stepped across that line, we knew that we may not exist. But we also knew that if we didn't step across that line, there was no reason for us to exist. Our job was to stand up for those kids. And you have to choose as a person and as a group whether you want to live on your knees or whether you actually want to stand on your feet. And Bryce stood on his feet regardless of the persecution coming at him. And that's what made him a great man. That's what integrity is all about, right? Integrity is doing the right thing when no one is watching, they say. And I think that's a good test. And integrity is doing it particularly when there is something to fear. That's when integrity matters. That's when I think we should test social work values or public health values or nursing values or physicians values. And definitely that's when we should test political values, right? <laughs> So those are the five universal values that Kidder came up with, honesty, respect, responsibility, fairness, and compassion. But they are only activated if we've got the guts to use it. We have to have the courage to do it. And I wanted to just bring some examples of people who have been courageous so that we can kind of see what this looks like and from people of all walks of life. So I came across this guy who you probably all know. I'm not sure how do you say the first name, Cole Dillon. But he was a whistleblower, an indigenous person who was in the police force and was a whistleblower about the corruption uh, within the police service. 
and this was in, uh, this news article comes to us on June 18th in 2016. And he suffered enormous persecution. But he had the moral courage to stand up for those values that we just saw, respect and truth and honesty. And he was prepared to take the blow back here. Like he is an example of someone who I think should be in social work textbooks as an exemplar of what social justice really looks like. And it's not enough, it's important to realize that being morally courageous isn't just being that first person who speaks out. Being morally courageous means when you see someone like him taking that morally courageous stance, that you are amongst the first to get up on your feet and stand with them so that they are not standing alone. Too often, we're kind of self-serving. We don't, well, we don't want to go next to her because she's been kind of targeted by the government. I don't want to get into any trouble, right? We've been trained not to get into any trouble. My whole life has been getting into trouble. That's what we're supposed to be doing, but for the right reasons, right? And learning how to do it. This is another one, Sally Yates. I live next door to the United States, so it just feels like a megaphone coming across the border a lot. But she provides us with a really good example. Here she is, a career bureaucrat, much like uh, Dr. Bryce is. She was in the Department of Justice, and as you will remember, just days after Trump's election, and he got sworn in, one of his first things was to kind of bar immigrants from different types of countries, didn't want that. And uh, she was one of the people who went over to the White House to say, not only do I think this is illegal as a Department of Justice, but this is also unethical. And of course, Trump's first response is to fire her, right? But she goes out there publicly and she actually makes the case that being fired in this instance is the absolute right course of action because she is not prepared to be silent. She is not prepared to be a puppet and she's not prepared to go against the values that she has sworn an oath to, which is the Constitution of the United States, which begins with we the people, right? She understands that her obligation is something higher than the person who has authority over her. And that's an important difference, is sometimes we feel we have to satisfy the person that is right above us. But truly, I think that we have to be in service to the values and to the public good, which is a far higher calling, and she really demonstrates that. Maybe she'll run for president, I don't know. And of course you all know this man, right? He's on the other side of the political scale than I am, but a man of, that really demonstrates that regardless of where you locate yourself politically, there are people of integrity at all levels. Not only was he a Vietnam War hero who refused to go when uh, they offered him an early release because his family was full of admirals and the North Koreans thought, well, this would be a good PR son. He said, no, I'll sit here and be tortured. Imagine that. I'd rather sit here and be tortured because there's other uh, people who have been here longer than I have. That's what integrity is. And then not only after that, he became one of the most vocal spokespersons against Trump. In fact, even if you look at the Today's News, you'll find a letter that he wrote to the American people where he calls them back to the values of America itself and away from the division and dissent and discrimination that has become such a tinderbox in the United States. Like if he's just a man of moral courage. We may not agree with all the views that he has. We may not have agreed with all the views of Sally Yates or Dr. Bryce. But fundamentally, these people had the, the courage to stand up with integrity for what they believed. And more importantly, none of them were ideological or righteous. I always am alarmed by righteousness because when you think you're righteous, you're rarely right. It means you stop wanting to do the right thing and you're more interested in being right. 
So when you want to be right versus do right, you're in danger. I think you become a real hazard in the public policy. And we saw McCain learn that over time. Sometimes he would take stands that he would, would be quite vehement about, but then he'd step back and others would criticize that point of view and he'd realize that he had to change his position. He was a great leader. Now, you don't have to be one of these extraordinary people to have moral courage. And this is a great YouTube channel that you can go to. It's based out of the United States, but I would love to see a Canadian version and maybe you would like to see an Australian version. But what it is, is a YouTube channel of vignettes, of people of all walks of life. So we have a teenager who does not believe that abstinence works in sex education and she lives in one of the most conservative towns in the United States, Lubbock, Texas. So instead of just putting up with this, she starts to, to really lobby and starts teaching proper sex education. There's a Muslim woman in a rock band. There is our public servants who come across malfeasance in the public servant who are whistleblowers like Bryce. There's people in corporations who know about misconduct, environmental misconduct that speak out. And one of the things I, I have my own students do is go on here and watch some of these vignettes that speak to you. Because there's some kind of weight that gets on top of us that gets in the way of us being morally courageous and I've always been interested with that. Somehow we're all more afraid of being morally courageous than being a moral coward. And I asked them to think of a time when they were in this situation and they saw something or heard something and they thought, ooh, this is wrong. I should do something. But then you get that feeling in your heart of, oh my God, there's some kind of danger. You may not even know what it is, but you just know speaking out, it could be to your friends at your dinner table or your family, it could be on the bus, it could be in your, in your staff room or on your, your team. You don't know, but you just feel like you're gonna take a hit if you say something. And so you let the moment pass. How are you feeling a week later? Are you happy about what you did? Are you relieved? You're relieved in the short term. But if you're like me, you're kicking yourself and thinking about all the things you should have done and should have said, and that's torturing your conscience, and then you end up taking all these self-help groups. Now let's rehearse that same scenario, because we've all been moral cowards in our lives at different times, I certainly have. But let's take a time when you are in that same situation but you've been a morally courageous person and we all have done that as well. So you got that lead up again where you're feeling, oh my God, there's a, they said something or they did something and there's going to be a hit and then despite the fear, you do something and it's almost like you're in shock when you do it, right? It's kind of like it's happening before you and then you just do it and then you kind of panic because you think, well, okay, well, now what do I have to brace for? But a few hours later and a few days later, you're feeling proud of who you are. You're not thinking I should have said something or done something. I really think one of the best things for self-help and social work is just for doing your working with integrity. If you do that, all you need is what I often go to, which is bath bombs and cheesies. But if you are working in a place where you are morally a coward, where you are not advancing the public good, where you are doing what Zygmunt Bauman, the sociologist said, is that you leave your ethics at the door and you take on the ethics of the organization or the institution you work with, and that you become, you're willing to become insubordinate or pardon me, you're willing to become subordinate to bad ideas, you're willing to do whatever's asked of you, and that's how you raise through the system, then you're gonna be at every yoga class that's on offer, right? So this is a great teaching tool.
and uh, they add regular ones on there every day and it's all about everyone has the potential to be morally courageous but you do have to practice it you have to practice it in the small moments of your life so when you come to something like Bryce did or like Senator McCain has challenged or like Mr. Dillon confronted in the police service that you're ready for that big moment to do the right thing because all of you will not only have confronted something like that, but you will confront something like that into the future. And you want a model for students and for children that you've got the guts to stand up and be counted when it counts, right? When the chips are down. Now, there's other kind of flaws to moral courage, like where it kind of goes off the rails. I find people tell me that they've been morally courageous when I kind of think, mm, not sure about that, right? And it can be difficult. So. These are some of the things that get in the way of us being morally courageous. When there are two rights, well, one right thing is for me to get a paycheck. Keep the employer on my side, right? I have kids, I might say to myself. I have to pay the rent. I have to do this. I have to get this. And that somehow that fear and that duty overtakes another right which is to speak up about something that's going wrong in the institution. And so it is, a comp it is a competing of loyalties. And those are the real situations social work students walk into, particularly in bureaucratic institutions. And we need to prepare people to make these hard choices because they are hard choices. And what I ask all my students to do, and I ask of myself too, is even if I fail to do the honorable thing, I want to know that I failed. I want it to be a conscious decision that I own and that I learn from, and that I can then change later. But I don't want to just kind of ease through it and then somehow excuse it and parcel it in the back and then continue to make these steps increasingly into unethical space. Right versus wrong, that's an easier one. You choose a clear wrong, or per per perpetuating a clear wrong when there's a right. It sounds clear cut, but I just came back from Berlin and there was a plaque there talking about the role of social workers in the Holocaust. We were out identifying children with disabilities and other challenges who should be a part of the final solution. It was a compassionate thing to do. And so we have to be very cautious about assuming benevolence, about not seeing the downside of what we're doing because we have consistently been a part of injustice. And we have to own that as a profession and as a person. So you can reframe things very clearly. And then the Holocaust, they did that a lot. A lot of professionals were part of that. Doctors, nurses, engineers, architects, social workers, people who had sworn codes of ethics became instruments in this. And what they did is that they reframed the right as being, being part of creating a utopic society. And that was the right goal. So the wrong was just an expense along the way. And we see this in colonization too, right? With the whole idea around the stolen generations and with residential schools. Well, okay, it's not so good to remove all these Indian kids from their families. But it, without removing them, they're not gonna get an education. And they're not gonna be able to be functioning members of society. We have a duty to have conversations and debates around these things. And that's why I have a little bit of a problem with so much emphasis on safe spaces for social workers. I don't think we really need to be in a safe space. I think part of it, creating a, the duty for us is to have a space where ideas can be challenged, but where we don't get into the pettiness of challenging people on a personal level. But we can't get a uh, slip slide into this place where no one gets challenged. No, uh, and that we 
really identify our personal identity with doing good, and therefore we're not receptive to any feedback coming back that we're not doing that. <coughs> Wrong versus chance. Now here's a big one, right? Um, we're doing the wrong, when doing the wrong seems better than taking a chance on doing the right thing. You don't really know if what you're gonna do is making a difference. So you decide you're just gonna keep quiet, not do anything. And my view is on this is, if I was a child and something was happening to me, would I rather see an adult fail at trying to help me than seeing one just sit down in their chair and be silent and still? And the answer is yes, I'd rather have someone fail trying to help me. Because in that failure, they're sending a message that they, they love me enough to stand up for me. And even if they don't succeed, like Bryce did not succeed, but in that morally courageous moment, they're setting in place seeds that will be picked up by others and picked up even by Bryce himself that allows for justice to grow. So we have to be willing to fail in trying to create justice. It's that sp speech by Roosevelt, right? Get into the arena. And even if you fail fighting in the arena, at least you were in the arena of justice. So here's my checklist of moral courage that I try to keep myself invigilated to, which is, I look at the situation, I ask myself, do I need to be courageous? And if I let myself off the hook too easily and I say no, I usually go back and think about it again. Because it's easy to kind of just push that off and then scan for the values. What are the values I'm actually standing up for? And to what degree are they my values? And to what degree are those values aligned with the public good, right? Because sometimes it might be a personal transgression, something that's just pushing me personally, that really doesn't matter to the greater public. So although it might be my personal business to deal with, it's not part of my work as a social worker. To stand for conscience, what principles need to be articulated or defended? That's that piece, that higher thing. For John McCain, it was the US Constitution. For Dr. Bryce, it was the Hippocratic Oath. Um, so think about what that, that, those overarching kind of philosophical values or raison d'etre is. And that's what you're in service of, not in service of an organization, and not in service of your business card. When I meet some of the best advocates in the world, they don't ring off every publication that they've written, right? I see a lot of people at conferences where they send in these long CVs and then the first thing on the table is, oh, I don't know where they got that. Well, I do, they sent that in, they wanted that read, right? They're more interested in being right than doing right. Contemplate the dangers. So yeah, it's fair enough to think about the dangers out there. In fact, it's something you need to do. What is some of the pushback that could happen? And then how can you prepare yourself and prepare others to take that pushback? And to give you an example of this, so I told you about the retaliation from Canada. What they did is deployed 189 public servants to monitor my online communications and my personal movements. And in fact, they have detailed notes of a talk I gave in the middle of the desert around Alice Springs, Australia. Huh? And they have email transactions going back and forward saying they were looking for evidence to get the case kicked out on frivolous and vexatious grounds. Translated into layman's terms, they're trying to find out some kind of dirt on me so that they could get the case kicked out because legally they weren't able to do that in their other eight attempts on jurisdiction. So I found out through Canada's own documents, I got this bunch of documents for access to information and I got all these documents from these public servants, going backwards and forwards. And at the time, my 17-year-old nephew was living with me. And at first I was shocked looking at these things. So you just get horrified, like, you know, I'm naive, right? Like I, I'm thinking, oh, this kind of stuff happens to people on the, on the terrorism watch list, not to a social worker who doesn't even have a parking ticket, right? But then you start to feel afraid. I was thinking about my nephew, like, 
what are they watching on his online stuff? What are they doing? Will it affect him? Then I started thinking about um, how angry I was at them for doing this, how, um, how uh, in some ways even vengeful I felt. I had their names, all the public servants' names, and I had a public platform. I could have got on national radio in a hot red second and said, Joe Smith said this. This is what you're spending your tax dollars on. But I, I was gifted by many supportive people teaching me through the years that when you, this happens to you, you have to view it as an opportunity. So they were doing this, and I knew one thing for sure, is I could not fight on their low ground. I could not stand up for privacy rights by violating the privacy rights of even those who I perceived had done me wrong. So what I did is I waited for six months to kind of balance myself out emotionally to figure out how I could use this to actually advance the case for the kids. And I, well, I contacted one of our trusted media sources, and I said, I've got a story for you, and I'll give you the, source, the original source documents, but you must not say the names of the public servants and you must not release them. That's the deal. Because what I had in my mind is a vision of one of those public servants driving their kids to school and that coming over the radio. And I cannot stand up for children's rights if you're going to do something like that. And so it went over the national news, and then, um, you know, all kinds of international pressure came down on Canada for trying to quash the case. And so we picked up a whole pile of news coverage from a whole new audience that's interested in government surveillance and big government intrusion into public life that wasn't that interested in Indigenous kids. So the case actually got more legs under it because of the way you, the, you decide to handle that. So contemplate the dangers and think about how you can do with that. And there's the, that Gray and Martin group, and I can give you the citation later, actually here from Australia, wrote a great article on backfire that actually helped me navigate that whole process. And there's another group called Frontline Defenders that every social work class should be taught about. And they are actually an international group that helps people who speak out and have the moral courage on a wide variety of human rights issues. And they've got fantastic advice, and it's all free on their website, frontlinedefenders.org. So you contemplate the dangers, you've got a plan to deal with them, and you've got to endure the hardship. You know, I just think that our fundamental role in society is to stand up for kids. And yeah, you're going to, have to go through some hard times for that, but that's nothing compared to what they're going through. And that's our job as social workers, but we have to be honest with how much hardship you're prepared to endure. Too often social work is put out there as this flowery, nice kind of profession where you get to do all this good stuff. We don't talk about hardship, we don't talk about sacrifice, and we don't talk about being afraid. And we need to talk about those things if we really want people to have integrity to the public good and integrity to values. And um, avoid the pitfalls, right? So you, you don't want to be in a situation where you're firing off every firecracker, right? That you're taking on every challenge and everywhere you see a threat and an opportunity to be morally courageous. You do have to be strategic about what you're gonna be doing here. But you also don't wanna be just that person who's sitting down and doing nothing while you do that, right? You gotta start practicing that moral courage in those moments. And that's the final thing, is just you gotta practice it, you gotta do it. We gotta teach people how to do it. Because courage does not come naturally to people. It really doesn't, right? Um, here's some other uh, perils, we've talked about them a little bit already, is this assumption of benevolence and assumption of courage. When we say we're do-gooders and we're in social justice, we kind of are already anointed ourselves as having those characteristics without having earned them, right? And um, I think it's really important that we're aware that sometimes it's we the good guys who are doing the harm, right? It's not this easy kind of thing where we can cast the wrongdoers as on the other side. Sometimes it's us as the good guys who are doing the harm. And we also have an ability to minimize harmful consequences experienced by people outside of their group. 
And we do that in a variety of ways. I find it really interesting. We use the word overrepresentation of First Nations kids in care. It's almost like we cleanse the language so it doesn't feel like a hands on a blackboard to say. And instead of using that, I now talk about the way that First Nations kids experience it. In Canada, First Nations kids are 12 times more likely to be in foster care than other kids. And they're there because of the same reasons that uh, Bryce found. Poverty, inequitable public services, all those things drive kids in care. But what I use now is I think about it the same way children think about it, which is how many sleeps do I see my mom? When we added up the number of First Nations kids nights that First Nations kids have spent away from their homes in foster care between 1989 and 2012, it came to over 66 million nights or 187,000 years of childhood. That makes those consequences much more difficult to escape or excuse or normalize. Diffusion of responsibility. It's not me, I'm just one little peg in a hole. It's a whole array of people. It's a system. I can't stand that excuse. We all have to make our own choices about how we're gonna operate in these systems. And these systems only perpetrate wrong because we're willing to be a part of that wrongdoing. And so we have to figure out ways of supporting people who are whistleblowers, promoting that kind of courage, and in the end changing these systems that we've, we've structured that lead to injustice. And normalizing failed policies and practices. We do that a lot with Indigenous kids. Like it's kind of like, oh, it's always been that way. I know back home the Canadian government says we're making good first steps towards equitable treatment of First Nations kids. It's been 111 years. When did they move to step two? You know? And why is it okay for our kids to be subject to a program, public policy of incremental equality when every other kid in the country is treated fairly? And the other way we do that is complicated, right? They'll say it's complex. And as my mother always said, she said, when you come across a complex situation, look for the obvious because almost no one does. You know, like they'll say, the Canadian government will say, it's too complex to get clean water to, to all First Nations. But we're regularly sending dark teams halfway across the world to get water pumping in an earthquake zone. Why is it so hard an hour and a half outside of Toronto? It's not, right? But that's the kind of thinking that allows us to perpetrate and normalize injustice in our midst. And in fact, we as the First Nations also accommodated that. We started to get used to the unequal treatment and to be grateful for that little bit less of inequality that we had and we're now getting. And a little bit more afraid of speaking out because what if they took that away from us? That was how we became kind of acculturated to it. Moral perils, loyalty to the organization. Again, if you, more, if you have loyalty to a person or to an organization, if you fall in love with that organization or your business card, you're done. Right? Think about that higher constitution. Ignore or minimize dissent. I would actually put myself purposefully in groups that I knew disagreed with me. And I would bring up my topic because sometimes they were right. Often when we're doing advocacy, we actually only support or surround ourselves with people who agree with us. And then we feel really emboldened to be able to dismiss very quickly the dissenters. But if you're interested in doing right, you need those dissenters. They're fundamental to the process of actually making sure you're doing the right thing. Too much reflection can lead away from doing action. We need to cons have a consultation about this. We're working with partners. We're engaging with so-and-so. I say, why? Some of these things are so well-defined, like just get on to doing it, right? That can be an official procedure that mass action. Bystander apathy, someone else can change it. I'm not smart enough, I'm not senior enough, I'm, that's not really my role, someone else can do it. No, it's you that has to do it, right? We have to call ourselves to account to be that first person at the station. And as I said, even if you fail, you still would have done the right thing and rewarding conformity and punishing moral courage. We have to stop doing that, we really do.
You know, like I have, um, and also not letting people get away with um, foolish kind of moral courage where they get these righteous positions that really are about violating human rights versus standing up for human rights. Um, but we have to create places where we really uplift those people who have got the guts to stand up and tell us what we have to hear. So what became of Bryce and these guys? Well, we know that Bryce got a historical plaque, and we know that we left off with Duncan Campbell Scott being lauded in Canadian history. In fact, I first met Duncan Campbell Scott in my Canadian literature book in high school, and I thought his poem sucked back then, but I had no idea about his day job. <laughs> No, nothing was said about that. It was all Confederate poet, this is a Canadian, and we just came off the whole English literature stuff, and it was kind of a downer to go to Duncan Campbell Scott. But it was interesting. We have, in Western culture, there's this real reverence for erasing all the bad things in the past. You know, I always find it interesting. I go around the world, I read the obituaries. I was reading your obituaries just yesterday in the paper. And these people are angelic, right? Like if the world was filled with these people, we wouldn't have any problems at all, right? No problems at all. And I remember saying to the elders, I said, I can't figure out why they put those huge monuments on their grave sites. I said, I don't think that's gonna help, right, to these people. Like if their goal is to get into, you know, their heaven or whatever they think that is, I don't think, I don't think that's a ladder on the way up. And he said, oh, you've got it completely wrong. You're not thinking the right way. He said, no. He said, those big monuments, Cindy, are to weigh them down. <laughs> They're to weigh them down. We, we have this Western thing where we don't want to talk about the past, the bad things we did in the past, and that gets into our professional teaching too, right? Duncan Campbell Scott had a plaque. It talked about his, his, his Confederate poet and his receipt of honorary doctorate degrees. Now, putting up Dr. Bryce's plaque was kind of an easy thing to do, to convince the cemetery to do, because it's a good story. But what about changing the plaque? So I went to see Duncan Campbell Scott. Duncan Campbell Scott is buried just over the hill from Dr. Bryce, interestingly enough. They can keep an eye on one another. And uh, I went to see him. I finally got up the courage to go see him just before our Truth and Reconciliation Commission report was released. I felt that had to be my act of reconciliation. I had to be in a proper space to go there, one that respected. Um, particularly his daughter is buried with him, his only daughter who passed at 12. I wanted to make sure I went with a good mind. So I go there, I do my bit with Duncan Campbell Scott, I ask him to be his spirit, to be a teacher to this generation of bureaucrats. And then I walk by that plaque, and I read it. And I knew elders would be coming to the cemetery to see Dr. Bryce. And this one is right beside the parking lot. So I go in and I am ready for a fight with the cemetery people. I get all my, I go back home, I get all my original source verification on Duncan Campbell Scott. I go to the cemetery and I make myself an appointment with the top guy at the cemetery. And I've got all my argument, not only do I have all my arguments all laid out, I have some of the members of the Christian churches who are prepared to back me if they say no, because I expected them to say no. And I go in there and the guy has coffee poured already. I've read some of the materials you sent over, he says, so how do I make this right? It took me about five minutes to recalibrate. <laughs> and I, that, in that moment, he taught me something, that I had become so used to fighting in the tribunal that I had forgotten what it's like to not have to fight, to actually meet a person of good conscience who wants to do the right thing. So we removed his plaque, that day, so the elders wouldn't have to see it. And I promised him that I would work with historians and others and we would put up another plaque for Duncan Campbell Scott. So um, Duncan Campbell Scott now has a plaque and it says, Confederate poet, we want to recognize the good things he did and cultural genocide on the same plaque. 
And the reason we wanted to recognize the good things is another way we dispose of wrongdoers is we make them the one bad apple in the cart. And we therefore think there's nothing like them that we can distance ourselves from them. But the truth is many of these characters are much more complicated than that. They were considered to be loving fathers. They were considered to be loving aunties. They were considered to be good people of good standing in the community. But they also did these horrible choices. Now, history has got a sense of humor to it, I think. This is Duncan Campbell Scott's office. It still stands in Ottawa. If you come to Ottawa, you'll be able to see his office. And, um, you know, have you ever lived in a house or in a place where you fell in love with those lands and you had to leave for whatever reason and new people were going to move in who you didn't know? And you, you thought, I wonder if they're going to take care of it like I look after it. wonder if they're going to love it as much as I love it. I can only imagine after spending 52 years in this building and retiring that Duncan Campbell Scott wondered the same thing and how he would have felt if in another several decades, a new group moved in with boxes from the Aboriginal People's Television Network. <laughs> Their first Ottawa bureau was set up in Duncan Campbell Scott's office. They didn't even know it. But there they were, broadcasting Indigenous languages and Indigenous programming to the world from Duncan Campbell Scott's office. Here's the curriculum that we created uh, out of the plaques because I really feel that as we do this, this recontextualizing of history, it's not enough just to plug a plaque somewhere. We have to use that knowledge to, in to collectively inform a discussion on how we do better. So um, we took Dr. Bryce and Duncan Campbell Scott's stories and translated them into this curriculum. And this is the one that BC judges use. You can go check it out on the website. Uh, so all that historical research is now being done in schools and I regularly walk into schools in Canada where I see Dr. Bryce on the kids' walls of heroes now, right? So there's this whole new generation who will know Dr. Bryce and they want to grow up to be like Dr. Bryce. And they know that even though you can get a short-term win and be a Duncan Campbell Scott, that over the long run, you run the risk of someone like me walking by your gravesite a few hundred years later, or a few decades later, saying, ah, this one needs a bit of a revision, right? So if we want to implement the solutions that are already on the books for Indigenous children, we need to recognize that they already exist. We need to understand that research can be a very beneficial thing but it can also be an official procedure to mask our action. We need to understand and give deep deliberation to what are the values that really count to us and what are the values that really uh, we have a share an oath to to the profession. Is our duty to the employer or is our duty to the public good? And then what are we prepared to sacrifice? My whole goal is to raise a generation of social workers who are prepared to get into lots of trouble for doing the right thing. And I want to raise a generation of kids who are prepared to get into lots of trouble for doing the right thing too. Because I think this is exactly what the world needs right now. And thank God for the trouble getters. I met some of them yesterday. <laughs> the elders who are challenging some of the misinformation that is being put out about the cultural uh, costing of, of, of looking at different sites. We need to be thankful for the people who got the guts to get into trouble for doing the right thing and challenge ourselves to try and live up to that legacy. Thank you. Mm -hmm.